Welcome back to the Journey Through the Word study. This is the study for Sunday, May 3rd, 2020. Before we get started together, I'd like you to make sure that you have three things available. First, make sure you've got a Bible for everybody in the room, and it's open to 2 Samuel chapter 5. Secondly, I would encourage everybody to grab a notebook, grab a pen, so that you can take notes through our study this morning. It will help you to remember the things that we're discussing and help you to think through them at the same time as well. And lastly, make sure that you've got some cracker and some juice so that we can take communion as we wrap up this study this morning. If you need to, pause the video, go grab those things and come back. Now, I really enjoy time travel stories. I remember as a kid uh, watching Quantum Leap, that, that television show in the late 80s and early 90s, and the science behind it really intrigued me. And then a number of years ago, I was introduced to a book by Michael Crichton. He also wrote Jurassic Park, but this one's called Timeline, and the science in there just really intrigued me. But... My favorite time travel story of all has absolutely no science whatsoever, and it's Bill Murray's Groundhog Day. His character lives through the same day over and over and over again, and there's been debate through the years. How many years did that continue? For some of us, living the same day over and over could be a curse. It would be absolutely horrible. There's times when I've wished I could manipulate time because, man, it's been a perfect day. It's just been absolutely wonderful, and I, I don't want it to end. But yeah, there have been some times where I've messed something up big time, and I, I've wished that I could go back in time and, and have a do-over. I'd, I'd like to try that again and fix that mistake. And then there are times when I wish I could just get past an event because it's just moving so slow. I want time to hurry up. Can we just can we skip this and move on? And I I'm frustrated by it cuz time seems to be moving so slowly. Maybe you've felt that way during this COVID-19 experience when it is just it just keeps dragging on, and you wish we could just get past this and let's get on with life. And I know there are times when I have complained to God, maybe you have too, because time isn't working the way that you'd like it to. I know I have done that. Why have I done that? Because deep down, Ultimately, what it, it is, is I'm not getting what I want when I want. And to top it all off, there's nothing I can do to influence the timing of it whatsoever. And that can really frustrate me. Over the course of the past week, if you've been reading through the Bible with me, if then you've read the end of 1 Samuel and the beginning of 2 Samuel. That story, that event that's recorded there, has really challenged and confronted my occasional frustration with time. If you haven't been reading with us, I'd invite you to find the link in the description below to the Bible reading plan and, and join in with me. What I'd like you to do right now, you've got your Bible open in front of you, and I'd, I'd like you to have somebody in the room read 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Pause the video, read that passage, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, and then restart the video. Now, if you've joined me in the reading the last week, then you've read 1 Samuel chapter 30, through 2 Samuel chapter 5. You've also read 1 Chronicles 10 through 12. And even though we're three books, what we've ended up doing is reading the same 
story, the same single story, in three different places. This is why we're doing a chronological reading plan, because we, we see this story and we see its fullness and its richness at one time instead of reading it a couple of times. And I know for me that can get really confusing because I've, I've read this before. And so we're doing all this flipping back and forth through the, the books of the Bible in order to get the fullness of this story. And in this case, what we've read at the end of 1 Samuel, the beginning of 2 Samuel, and again in 1 Chronicles, is the transfer of Israel's throne from one king, Saul, to a new king, David. Saul had become king at about 30 years old, and during his reign, God had told him that Saul had actually lost the throne not just for himself, but his entire family. And the reason behind that was that Saul had refused to obey God. While he was still on the throne, Saul learned that another man, another entire family, was going to be taking the throne in his place. And that was David. David was anointed king while Saul was still alive and had a number of years on the throne. In fact, about 15 from what we're told. That means that David found out he was the next king of Israel, and he had to wait 15 years to become king. I cannot imagine what David went through as he was waiting if it had been me, I know I would have been really frustrated with God. I would have been looking at God and saying, when can we get this show on the road? You've told me I'm the next king and Saul's still here. I'm still not king. In 2 Samuel 1, we read of David's learning of Saul's death. A man shows up with, to David and he says, Hey, um, I killed Saul. I expect this man was probably surprised by David's response. He says, You're going to die. I'm going to have you executed because you confessed that you killed the Lord's anointed. I, I wonder if there was a shocked, surprised look on that man's face. I wonder if he, he said, Now, wait a minute, I, David, I, you're going to kill me, but I've, I've helped you become king. You don't have to wait any longer. You're, you're done waiting. And David's response is interesting. In Scripture, we read that David actually mourned the death of Saul. He didn't celebrate it. He wasn't excited about it. Instead, he was grieving. I don't know about you, but if I'd had to wait for the last 15 years to become king, and remember, David has survived 15 assassination temp attempts by Saul, I'm certain that if that had been me, my response would have been really different. But even in that circumstance, even in that time, David did not claim the kingship over Israel. Instead, what he did is he turned to God and he says, God, what do you want me to do now? God says, I want you to move to the city of Hebron. And after David moves there... The tribe of Judah gathers to the city of Hebron, and they crown David king over the tribe of Judah. Again, if that had been me, I would have been scratching my head and thinking, God, you, you told me I'd be king over all Israel. I'm now crowned king over one tribe of Israel, one piece of Israel. This isn't what you told me was going to happen. And after David is crowned king of Judah, there's a seven-year civil war. Saul's son, Ishbosheth takes his father's crown over Israel. 
And there is great loyalty to Saul's family and to Ishbosheth as the king of Israel. But over that seven year period, as, as David's house and Ishbosheth's house fight this war, the loyalty to Saul's family slowly fades. And at the same time, the loyalty to David's family slowly grows. It's interesting that even in this time of civil war, we don't read of David turning to God and demanding anything. David didn't demand anything of Ishbosheth either. David did not rant at God and say, Look, you told me I'd be king of Israel, not Ishbosheth. He didn't demand that the people of Israel follow him and say, Look, you, this is wrong. You need to be following me because God anointed me, not Ishbosheth. Instead, David waited. Seven years of this civil war. And in 2 Samuel chapter 4, we read that two of Ishbosheth's military commanders actually rebel against him. They assassinate him as he sleeps. And in 2 Samuel chapter 4, we find David's response to these men. I'm going to start reading in chapter 4, verse 8. Would you read along with me? 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 8. When they arrived at Hebron, they presented Ishbosheth's head to David. Look, they exclaimed to the king, here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of your enemy Saul, who tried to kill you. Today the Lord has given my Lord the king revenge on Saul and his entire family. But David said to Rechab and Banna, The Lord who saves me from all my enemies is my witness. Someone once told me Saul is dead, thinking he was bringing me good news. But I seized him and killed him at Ziklag. That's the reward I gave him for his news. How much more should I reward evil men who have killed an innocent man in his own house and on his own bed? Shouldn't I hold you responsible for his blood and rid the earth of you? So David ordered his young men to kill them, and they did. They cut off their hands and their feet and hung their bodies beside the pool in Hebron. Then they took Ishbosheth's head and buried it in Abner's tomb in Hebron. You see, these two guys, they thought they were helping David. They thought that David would appreciate the revenge that they had taken upon themselves to carry out. And instead, what they found was that David was entirely content with God's timing. And they were executed. How about you? Are you content with God's timing? Or do you try to influence events so that things happen in your timing? Do you complain when things don't happen according to your schedule? It seems to me that if anyone had reason to be upset with God's timing, it was David. He had waited nearly 22 years to get what God had promised him. 22 years! And I think about that and I think, man, we've... We've been told to stay at home for just over 40 days. Days, not years. And I've done my fair share of complaining to God about his timing. When we don't see God moving, it can be easy for us to, to start thinking that he's not doing anything because we don't see what he's up to. And, and we resort to complaining or to manipulating the circumstances to our benefit. And what we end up doing is we miss out on what God wants to be doing. While we're complaining and while we're frustrated with the fact that God doesn't seem to be moving, we miss what he wants to be doing. We, 
We read about that in Psalm chapter 81, and I'd like you to turn there. If you need to pause the video, that's just fine. Psalm chapter 81. I'm going to read verses 8 and four, or eight through 14. Listen to me, O my people, while I give you stern warnings. O Israel, if you would only listen to me. You must never have a foreign god. You must not bow down before a false god. For it was I, the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it with good things. But no, my people wouldn't listen. Israel did not want me around. So I let them follow their own stubborn desires, living according to their own ideas. Oh, that my people would listen to me. Oh, that Israel would follow me, walking in my paths. How quickly I would then subdue their enemies. How soon my hands would be upon their foes. I want you to hear that. God wants to deliver his people. He wants to protect them. He wants to provide for them. But there was stubborn disobedience to God's order. The people of Israel didn't want to obey him. And so God did not deliver them. It is obedience and submission that move God to action. David understood that. And so he obeyed God. He submitted to God. And God moved. If you're wanting God to act in some way, you need to start submitting to him and obeying his ways, his order, because in that, God can move and act. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to get exactly what you want when you want, but you will get the best because God will deliver you to it. As you're waiting for God, I want you to think about what God is after, what God wants for you. Years ago, I was watching a video teaching, and I, I heard a gentleman by the name of Craig McConnell. He, he was doing a video teaching much like this, and, and he said this, In God's economy, there is no wasted time. He's after something. Do you hear that? From God's perspective, time is about what God is after, not what you and I are after, not about what we want, but what God has in mind for us. And so that brings us to our homework assignment for the week. I want you to ask God what he wants you to learn from the COVID-19 experience. We're living in a really strange sense of time right now. Things have been thrown off from what we're used to, what we're accustomed to. And I believe that if we approach God and ask him what he wants us to learn from something, that he will reveal it. Now, it will be in his time, not ours, right? But ask him. God, what do you want me to be learning from this right now? When we ask God to do that, not only will he answer us, not only will he teach us, but it prepares us for the lesson. It prepares us to listen for his answer. And so I want to encourage you to use this COVID-19 experience as an opportunity to grow closer to God. Ask him, what do you want me to learn? That draws you closer to him. The second way I want you to draw closer to God through this time is to be reading in your Bible. Again, find that Bible reading plan, that, that link in the description, and join the join us as we read through the Bible. You'll find just a, a couple of chapters a day. 
and use that to draw closer to God. Ask him each day as you open up your Bible, God, what do you want me to learn from today's reading? And stick with it. He'll answer you. And rather than being discouraged by our circumstances, I want to encourage you to use them to grow. Sure, we can complain and we can be frustrated, but that doesn't accomplish anything. Let's use this as an opportunity to grow closer to God. And even though we may feel like we're cursed and we're living in Groundhog Day, living the same day over and over and over, let's shift our perspective to see the opportunity that we have. Bill Murray's character did it, and he grew immensely. I realize that's Hollywood. That, that's a movie. But God can do the same thing through you and I. Let's not be content to be couch potatriots, as some TV commercials would have us do. Instead, let's get off our spiritual couches and get into the spiritual gym. Again, back to Psalm 81, verses 13 and 14. God says, oh, that my people would listen to me. Let's practice listening to God and get better at it. Oh, that Israel would follow me, walking in my paths. Let's practice that. Let's get stronger. Let's get more adept at following God. Right now, we've got a great opportunity to do that. Because then God says, how quickly I would subdue their enemies. How soon my hands would be upon their foes. Our foes, Scripture tells us, are not other people. Instead, it is the spiritual forces in this dark world. That discontent, that frustration that you're feeling may very well not be what God wants for you. I don't think it is at all. Instead, God wants us to be able to defeat those attitudes and those frustrations. And when we turn to Him, when we listen to Him, when we follow Him, then God says he will quickly subdue those enemies. If we use this time wisely, I am confident that God is going to bless us. I'm confident of it. Why? Because he said right there in chapter 80, or Psalm 81, verses 13 and 14, that he would. At the same time, he showed David that he would bless David if David would just follow him and obey him. This morning, I'd invite you to take that, that piece of cracker and that, that juice. And I want you to, at this time, declare again your loyalty to Jesus Christ. I would encourage you to resubmit yourself to God's timing. And maybe it's what you need to repent. You need to say you're sorry and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop being frustrated this week, God. I'm going to stop complaining this week, God. But I need your help. When we ask for his help, he's, he's more than ready and willing to give it to us. And as you eat that cracker and you drink the juice and you remember the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus for your sins and mine. He did it to bring us closer to God. Let's determine to be content in God's timing. And we're not going to be content so that others would look at us and say, why isn't this bugging you like it is me? Instead, we're going to be content in God's timing so that we can share that peace and that love with others, to encourage others to be content in God's timing. Ask Him right now, God, what would you have me to learn during this time? Open up your Bibles and spend some time reading today, tomorrow, and seek God. Because scripture, scripture says when we seek Him, we will find Him.